All right, good morning, everyone. My name is Brad Duncan. I work for Palo Alto Networks Unit 42, and I'm here to talk to you about malware distribution trends. Uh, a little about myself. Uh, I run the, for those that don't know, I run the uh, malware traffic analysis.net uh, website. Uh, plenty of examples of infection traffic uh, from malware and uh, um, actual malware samples. If you're actually going to uh, get copies of the malware from the site, beware. Uh, this is live stuff and you don't want to uh, accidentally detonate it on uh, some Windows host that you're using. And uh, I also tweet uh, quite frequently at malware underscore traffic. Uh, ju usually just the stuff that I'm posting on the blog. Occasionally I'll tweet about something like B-Sides Iowa going on today. And then uh, every once in a while just some really off the wall joke that makes you think I'm uh, socially retarded. Uh, disclaimer on this, uh, uh, I run into a lot of commodity malware. Uh, stuff that's not APT, stuff that's not specifically targeted. Uh, that's kind of a different uh, area, area that we're looking at here. What I'm discussing is the stuff that is mass distribution. The stuff that goes out uh, uh, indiscriminately. That's not really necessarily targeted. Oh, that's weird. Ah. Okay, that's not necessarily targeted, but uh, you could very well get it. Uh, uh, if we're talking malicious spam, a lot of this stuff gets uh, hit by your, uh, 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 you know, through the spam filters, uh, which you'll never see it. Now, the spam filters are definitely a uh, good way to get malware samples that uh, would otherwise hit your organization. And if you've got access to that, if you actually work uh, a security job, where you have access to uh, emails in the spam queue, uh, check through it. You might be surprised. There, uh, there is some good uh, stuff through there. But um, the stuff I'm going to talk about, uh, uh, hopefully I'll uh, uh, limit it to early April 2018, so hopefully it's timely. Things can and do quickly change. Uh, for example, two months ago at uh, B-Sides Tampa, I gave a talk on how ransomware was really on the... Uh, on the downturn, uh, there was a serious, um, and, and there still kind of is a uh, serious uh, uh, lower levels of ransomware uh, uh, that time this year than there was the time uh, before then. It was like I couldn't get away from ransomware. But uh, now, as we go into April, I'm seeing a lot more ransomware than I was seeing in January of uh, this year. So things can, and they do quickly change. And uh, personal bias. Like I said, I tend to look at the commodity stuff, and they're definitely, that's only part of the picture when you're talking about a specific malware threat to, your, uh, to yourself or your organization. So for today's talk, we're going to look at the types of malware, distribution methods. Uh, I'm going to go over tech support scans uh, briefly, those uh, fake uh, antivirus alerts that uh, come up through your web browser, because uh, we're seeing a lot more of those now than we did about a year ago. And uh, prevention strategies, what you guys can do to help prevent getting caught by malware. So in wide-scale distribution, uh, we most often find information stealers and backdoors, the sneaky malware that you don't know is running on your computer, uh, malware downloaders that can download any one of those uh, uh, types of malwares, uh, cryptocurrency miners are a big uh, thing that has uh, really taken off in the past uh, few months and ransomware. So uh, what do you guys think gets the most press coverage out of all those four categories uh, that I have up there? Ransomware. Ransomware, yeah. Now if I had a explosion sound effect, I'd put it there uh, with this uh, particular graphic. Because ransomware is a very relatable story on a human level. You've got stuff and some criminals are uh, holding it for ransom. That, uh, that speaks to everybody. Uh, however, uh, it tends to, uh, the very nature of news stories, you want to uh, get a hook to grab somebody's attention, right? So you're going to kind of play it to uh, try and hook a reader's interest. Uh, and uh, so my personal opinion is that we tend to play up ransomware in the open media a lot more than it is. Uh, uh, you know, as far as the threat is concerned. There are other things out there that you should also be worried about, but the press generally tends to focus on ransomware because it's a good story. 
Well, we all know about ransomware. I think by this point, everybody knows what ransomware is. You, uh, you know, get it through, uh, you're browsing the web or you get an email and uh, you're a faceless white couple uh, with a computer. <laughs> uh, and you have to pay money to a faceless criminal that uh, is, for some reason, still wearing a mask. So it's, uh, it's uh, fairly standard. I think we all know what ransomware is by now. Uh, so we've seen a lot of high-profile stories uh, in the past couple of years. The most recent one was uh, in March, the city of Atlanta got hit by ransomware. Uh, they didn't specify what type it was, but I think they're, uh, they think it's uh, Sam Sam or SAMHSA ransomware. And uh, just uh, earlier this week, one of the reporters at uh, WSTB TV in uh, WSB TV in Atlanta uh, reported that uh, they shelled out nearly $2.7 million um, as a way to, uh, you know, following the ransomware incident. Um, that probably has a lot more to deal with than just the ransomware. I'm sure there was some uh, endemic system problems uh, in the city of Atlanta. And, uh, uh, you know, it, it's a good number to throw out there. Once again, it's a hook to catch your interest. If you actually look at the details, how much of that is specifically going to the ransomware case, it, uh, it's a good question. Um, the Department of Health and Her uh, Human Services, uh, so far this year, at least eight cyber attacks uh, employing SAM SAM or SAMHSA ransomware, they reported that uh, have targeted uh, um, healthcare and government organizations. And in this case, it really is targeted um, because with SAM SAM or SAMHSA ransomware, uh, uh, your point of entry is a server. So uh, you're trying to find a vulnerable server that you can. Uh, exploit through automation. So if you have a server exposed to the internet and you're not fully patched or fully up to date, there's a vulnerability, uh, you, can, you can imagine that uh, it will sooner or later be exploited. And if you're the city of Atlanta or if you're uh, uh, one of the uh, other organizations, uh, commercial or government, that have been hit in the past few years by ransomware, it is because generally because you didn't have your servers fully patched and up to date. Now, Bitcoin is the general payment that we have, uh, that we see for ransomware. And if you look at the price in 2017, there were some wild fluctuations. Uh, for the longest time, Bitcoin was generally lower than $1,000 per um, uh, uh, per Bitcoin, the exchange rate. And uh, as the year went on, uh, the last few months of uh, last year, it really shot up. And it was very volatile, the prices. So uh, that is probably one of the reasons that we saw a decline in ransomware. There just was no stability in saying, uh, uh, okay, send me this amount of Bitcoin because a day or two later, the Bitcoin value will have fluctuated so rapidly that uh, uh, you're either getting far less than you originally asked for or far more, uh, depending on the day. Fortunately, since uh, uh, as we've gone into 2018, it's kind of stabilized. And uh, it was funny when uh, I see that, uh, you know, reports of Bitcoin that have dropped to like $6,000 per uh, US dollars per Bitcoin, they say it's a crash. I'm thinking for the longest time, uh, uh, Bitcoin wasn't even approaching that level. Yes, sir. Um, your previous slide, we're talking about uh, the, the method that the malware is attacking the system is on the servers that are exposed to the internet. And so it's not uh, an effect of a spear phishing or a just a phishing attack. It's, it's, you can't even do anything to, uh, to educate your users. It's just by the way you've architected your system that you've got these servers exposed to the internet and the ransomware is able to attack them. That is correct. Uh, the question here was, uh, um, it, uh, when I was talking, uh, mentioned earlier about uh, servers exposed to the internet, which uh, it, um, yeah, that it's not necessarily spear phishing, that it's not necessarily some of the other methods uh, uh, that uh, these organizations that we hear about that have gotten infected with ransomware. I said generally, for the most part. That's not to say that that, uh, uh, that, that is the only vector, and I'll, I'll get into that uh, uh, here in a few minutes. Um, so it, it's just that, uh, and it's not something I go into great detail here because I don't have examples of that. 
Uh, if you're an organization and you have a server that gets compromised, you're, you're generally not going to share all that information, that technical details on how it got uh, 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 compromised out with the general public. So it's a, it really is kind of hard uh, to get more detailed information on that. I can tell you about uh, you know spear phishing or just uh, phishing in general. Uh, you can get examples of that fairly easily. Uh, one of the types of uh, malware that propagates uh, that we'll uh, that we'll see a lot of. We first saw this happen last year uh, in the uh, spring or summer was when WannaCry or WannaCryptor came out. And uh, uh, it uh, has been reported as spreading during uh, via uh, SMB, the SMB protocol, Microsoft's SMB protocol through uh, uh, what is called the Eternal Blue exploit, which is when the hacking team was uh, hacked, one of their, uh, I'm sorry, not the hacking team, uh, it, it's, I believe, an NSA exploit, right? Uh, so somehow the criminals had gotten a hold of that and uh, were, uh, were able to implement it into this ransomware. Now the interesting thing about WannaCry is while it was big news last year when we first saw it, we're s definitely still seeing samples of that on a daily basis. So uh, as a uh, researcher at Palo Alto Networks, uh, uh, I've got access to virus total intelligence, uh, which apparently if your, your company is not paying for it, is very expensive. So I'm fortunate enough to uh, look through that, and I can actually search uh, through there on anything with uh, want to cry in the description or, or uh, the uh, virus total uh, detections on the antivirus uh, vendors and uh, anything that is first seen since April 1st. So when I look through that, I uh, see they stop counting at a thousand. So more than a thousand samples, new file hashes uh, that have come through here. I'm not sure what's been tweaked. But uh, we're seeing stuff that is at least identified by some of the antivirus vendors as WannaCry. And uh, just looking at the general size and the types of files, it seems to fall in line with what I've seen before. Now, uh, also, as a, uh, uh, my employer has a, a tool called Autofocus, and as a security researcher, I got access to that. And I can look at the uh, same thing. Uh, in this case, I'm looking at anything that we have tagged as some sort of ransomware. And I'm pulling for anything that was first seen after April 1st at 12 a.m. 26,000 samples uh, that we're seeing of ransomware. So it is really a lot more now uh, than we saw back in January, which is, uh, I think, less than half that. So the samples that are tagged WannaCry or WannaCryptor uh, that we have identified at Palo Alto Networks, uh, 2,500. And then uh, GANCRAB, how many, how many people have not heard of GANCRAB at this point? Uh, show of hands. Uh, I'll uh, go through that here uh, momentarily then. GANCRAB is a new uh, family ransomware that started appearing uh, back in January. But uh, the majority of ransomware samples uh, not the vast majority, but just the majority. Over half of that is uh, WannaCryptor or GANCRAB. Now, GANCRAB is interesting. Uh, GANCRAB, when it encrypts your files, it adds .crab as a file extension. And uh, GAND is uh, slang in India for butt, I believe. So I, I tend to refer it personally as butt crab ransomware. <laughs> But uh, everybody else calls it gain crab. But uh, so you infect a uh, host, which I did on Thursday evening, and uh, all the encrypted files are uh, appended with dot crab. It uh, throws up the decryption instructions, and it throws up a uh, window to Tor. So you can download the Tor browser, because uh, everything, if you had the Tor browser installed, it, uh, it uh, sitting on your desktop, it was encrypted. Um, so $1,500 uh, US. And the interesting thing about GANCRAB, when it asks for that money, is it asks you to pay for it in uh, a cryptocurrency called Dash. Now Dash is, uh, and that was the big news when it came out. It was like, oh, okay, there's a big move away from Bitcoin. Everybody's moving to Dash now. Even though there was one, uh, only one uh, family ransomware, to my knowledge, that uses Dash specifically as a cryptocurrency for your ransom payment. 
and uh, so three hundred and fifty dollars for one dash, and uh, uh, one thousand five hundred dollars. Now you can still pay in Bitcoin, right? It, uh, you can pay in Bitcoin, but you've got a fifteen percent service charge. Right? So uh, you're paying uh, what is it? Uh, one thousand six hundred and fifty dollars. Uh, oh, I'm sorry, that's ten uh, percent. But uh, anyway, you're paying about seventeen hundred dollars or so. So ultimately, ransomware is still out there, and it is doing a little bit of an uptick since uh, I saw this uh, lull uh, back in December and January. Uh, an interesting thing here is uh, yesterday, uh, yesterday afternoon, this week in ransomware, was reporting about a ransomware called PUBG, or PUBG, made you play uh, Players Unknown Battleground in order to decrypt your files. It's a joke, a joke ransomware. I always find those interesting. Uh, but even with the media attention on ransomware, we still see the vast majority of stuff that we run across is not ransomware, is information stealers, is malware downloaders, and uh, cryptocurrency miners, uh, which uh, were largely reported at the beginning of the year and uh, now are fairly commonplace. We still see them. I generally don't run into them much on the uh, mass distribution side, on the stuff that I end up looking at. But how does malware get from the criminal to us? Uh, email the web, social media, and attackers breach networks or servers and drop the malware. I'm not going to talk about that fourth one because, as I explained earlier, I generally don't have any of the technical details of the information on that stuff. Uh, social media, I've got a story that I'll share with you, but mostly we're, work we're looking at email in the web for mass distribution of malware, not APT style attacks. And uh, email is the most common method, hands down, that criminals use to distribute malware um, by volume. It doesn't mean that the email actually makes it to the intended recipients. Uh, but, for example, uh, how many people uh, for, like, their uh, uh, Gmail or uh, Yahoo or whatever you're using, uh, do you get the pill spam? You know, Viagra, Cialis, for some reason that, that stuff just gets to you. That just means that your email is on a list, right? Your email is on a list and uh, uh, it gets spread around. And so if your email is on a list and it's spread around to the uh, pharmaceutical spammers, uh, it could very well end up in the hands of people that are actually trying to send malware out there. If you got a Gmail account, you will probably, probably not see any actual <coughs> malware because they generally have a good way, of, a good method of filtering, uh, filtering for malware. If you got Yahoo, maybe a little less so. If you got AOL, uh, God help you. <laughs> So these emails contain archives with malware executables, which is very common and very easily blocked. Microsoft Office documents, Word, PowerPoint, Excel, um, rich text files that exploit Microsoft Office is a big thing that we started seeing a couple of years back. And uh, a significant percentage, not a, uh, definitely not a majority by far, but a significant percentage of the stuff that I see out there is some type of uh, RTF attachment to emails or link to an RTF uh, document that uh, will exploit a vulnerability in Microsoft Office. Uh, normally these have been patched uh, quite, a, you know, for months, but uh, these guys are still sending out these emails in the hopes of capturing some unpatched uh, Windows XP machine or something. Uh, another favorite is uh, archives with uh, any of those uh, file types. So, uh, for example, uh, Java archives. So you've got a .jar file, and uh, uh, you double-click it, and it does its thing. It uh, uh, backdoors your uh, computer uh, using Java. Uh, and then there are uh, just as often links to malware, right? So you got a, uh, and I'll show an example here, but you, uh, you have an email that says, uh, you know, look at this invoice, click here. You go there, it downloads a file. And then you open it, and uh, it's a uh, it, it's a decoy, and you're infected. So uh, my favorite one of the link type malwares is uh, uh, campaigns, mouse spam campaigns, 
is uh, what's called Hansiter or Chaniter or Tortle. Uh, this is a uh, malware that uses uh, macros in a Word document to infect your computer. And macros is pretty common because you're, uh, you're trusting the user to, to uh, uh, a average user's inclination to click through warnings to get to what they want to see. I'm not talking about anybody here in this room uh, or hopefully anybody watching the video uh, here. I'm uh, talking about the general user. And I think we all know a few of them and, and have run into them. Uh, I had one guy tell me, uh, you know me, I'm a clicker. It's like, I, dear God. But uh, so this was uh, back on uh, Wednesday of this uh, previous week from the Hanseter campaign. You got a link, and uh, uh, there are a number of domains uh, that they'll have there. And uh, so you got, uh, in this case, 16646.com, question mark. There's a string of characters equals another string of characters. And that second string of characters, is, it represents an encoding that uh, I haven't figured out yet, and nobody I've talked to has quite figured out yet, is uh, encoded and it represents the recipient's email address. So if you click on that link, uh, the server that uh, sends you the malware also records, okay, this is the email address of whoever, you know, clicked that link. So they're actually keeping track of who downloads their, uh, their malware. But, uh, yeah, you, uh, you click on the link. It says, hey, here's your invoice. And uh, there's a number of templates uh, that they'll use in these documents that basically tell you, hey, in order to view the content, you got to enable macros and here's how you do it because by default Microsoft Office will not enable macros however uh, you know certain uh, people or organizations may have disabled that in which case these uh, directions are pretty much meaningless but uh, for most people you'll see some sort of, uh, uh, of uh, message that says hey enable your macros and see the content and of course you don't see the content you don't see it at all it just has the same message and you figure well uh, okay I'll close it but you're getting infected behind the scenes uh, the old macros have been disabled um, and every once in a while you'll get uh, you'll get a link or you'll get an attachment that uh, says it's a document but it's actually a uh, rich text file with uh, some sort of code and uh, usually these are exploiting things that have already been patched with uh, Microsoft Office. So, for example, if you're running Windows 10 and uh, you got a good setup to where you know you're getting those patches, whether you want them or not, with Windows 10, uh, you're getting patched uh, uh, for Microsoft Office and uh, the various operating uh, system components that they've found vulnerabilities in. But uh, these are the general. Uh, um, CVEs that I'm seeing for the vulnerabilities that are being exploited by these Word documents, at least according to Virus Total when they tag them. There's a, uh, uh, what is it, uh, the uh, Microsoft uh, Equation Editor uh, vulnerability, that's a 2018 CVE, but I always forget what that is because people don't call it by the CVE, they call it the, the Equation Editor vulnerability. You know, be consistent for crying out loud. Uh, Here's another one from uh, earlier this week. Uh, this one, I believe, is uh, Brazilian mal spam. And uh, so it has a zip archive attachment. And that zip archive attachment uh, is uh, WhatsApp, except they uh, misspelled WhatsApp, if you notice right there. Uh, so, you know, that generally is a, a red flag, if you will. Uh, another red flag when you open that archive, open that zip file, uh, you get uh, something that's not VBS. Now, uh, uh, what is the default uh, setting for file extensions for uh, Windows? Hide them. Yeah, you hide them. So at best, uh, people are gonna see in the default configuration, they're gonna see .pdf. And they'll think even though the icon is clearly not a PDF icon, they'll uh, double click it and uh, if you look at the code, it's uh, highly obfuscated JavaScript code, and it will download malware. I forget what the uh, case was uh, in this instance, but uh, I just need an example for uh, today's presentation on that type 
of, uh, of uh, malware, that type of distribution method, which I see quite frequently. I just didn't have any uh, uh, easy examples from this past week. However, uh, I did find some examples of uh, mal spam uh, pushing uh, GAND crab ransomware. I'm sorry, this is not GAND crab. This is a, 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 a different. It's from the uh, Nikers botnet campaign, which is a uh, very long-running campaign that uh, uses uh, uh, various methods. So in this case, in this wave from uh, earlier this month, um, the uh, senders were all spoofed. So uh, at, after the ad sign was your recipient's email domain, right? So if you're, uh, it, it, you know, if, if this went to somebody at Palo Alto Networks and somehow made it to the uh, recipient, it would be Emily2018 at uh, paloaltonetworks.com. Photo from Emily, photo from Lee. Uh, the attachment names are uh, all some sort of um, supposed image. And if you look at these emails, and this is common for the Nikers botnet, is they will have a very standard template, or in this case, no message text at all. It was kind of weird. So uh, you open this up, and you find that it's an actual URL file. Now, the interesting thing about URL files, if you look at them in Microsoft Windows, uh, it, it doesn't even give you the option of uh, looking at the file extension. No matter what your settings are, you're not seeing that .url. You're just seeing that sh uh, 2018.04.04 bbd baa. So uh, the certainly the average person um, who is looking at this on Microsoft Windows is not going to see the uh, the code inside and not going to understand that this is uh, actually a URL that will uh, point to somewhere on on the internet. Now, if you look here, the URL is not HTTP. For web traffic, it's file colon backslash backslash. Uh, so what protocol is that? SMB. You're right. Uh, what port? 445. 445. TCP port 445. So that is generally what you're going to see. And uh, the interesting thing about this is um, I checked on Thursday night when I was putting the finishing touches on this show, and I went in uh, Windows host in my lab environment, I was able to find those VBS files sitting on the server, 60 of them, 60 of them in that directory, in the stream directory. There's another one on that server. And if you guys are curious, you could, if you've got a Windows host, you want to check it out, yeah, you can find 60 examples of malware probably right now as I'm speaking. Uh, if you're watching the video, probably, hopefully it'll be offline. But, uh, so I went through and most of the follow-up domains, because basically you've got that URL file. It's pulling a VBS file from a uh, server over SMB. And then you run that VBS file, and it will, again, grab through HTTP, the actual malware binary. So I, I checked uh, a few of them out on Thursday night, and, uh, you know, no luck, no luck, no luck. Wait, here's one. And uh, so uh, taxiheavies.eu is a site that's uh, legitimate but compromised, from what I can tell. And uh, it was hosting malware as of Thursday evening when I checked. So I think uh, if anybody wants to grab a copy of the malware, uh, you might still be able to do it by using that URL. So when I ran this in my test environment, I, uh, I got uh, a post-infection traffic, 92.53.77.184, port 80, HTTP post-infection traffic to uh, rowrotable.in. Uh, and the characteristics of this traffic uh, were uh, matched quant loader, which is what the Nikers botnet was pushing. Now, quant loader is just a malware downloader backdoors into your computer, and uh, we'll uh, download some additional malware. And uh, no, it's a couple of letters changed. It's not quant loader, it's a squanch loader. At least that's what they call it on planet squanch. 
Ultimately, there are many different files, uh, types of files used by criminals to install malware. And uh, malicious spam with links is harder to, uh, to catch by intrusion detection systems across the board. Uh, at least that's been my experience. It's a lot easier if you got that malware in the email, you can generally block it. If you just got a link to uh, something, it's a little harder and sometimes that will slip past systems. And uh, some types of malware have defense systems that will act differently um, if you're analyzing it. So if it knows it's being analyzed, and I've been tricked by this before because uh, uh, especially if I'm on the road, I'll generally use uh, my laptop and uh, one of my environments is VMware. And uh, I remember one time I got caught by uh, 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 the malware is called VDEP, uh, which I don't see anymore, but I was seeing a lot last year. And it actually acted differently. It, uh, in most cases, the malware just won't run if it detects it's being analyzed. But in some cases, like in the case of VDEP last year, I was getting completely different traffic. So it, it uh, really threw me off. So you got to be careful of that. Distribution through social media. Uh, how many people here do not have any sort of social media account? Ooh, one, two, three. Good Lord. You guys are the outliers. <laughs> it is uh, social media generally, uh, like email, you'll generally uh, see it, uh, what's called uh, what I tend to think of as mass distribution, but well, with a lot of social media platforms, you got to somehow connect with somebody. You can't just spam stuff out there like you can through email, right? Uh, so in the case of Skype, you have to be connected to somebody on Skype before they can send you something uh, that's a link to malware. In, in which case, uh, uh, it's pretty common. Um, it generally tends to be female uh, names. I'm sure the criminals are not female, or, or they could be. I don't want to be sexist. But uh, you'll get something usually, uh, something like, hey, uh, here's a picture of me. I, uh, do I look OK? Or I just got a new hairdo, or, or, or something that is just so vastly stereotypical, uh, baiting to click a link you know, for, uh, for some lonely, lonely guy, I guess. And uh, nope. I'm sorry, that was mine. My, my bad. Um, so in this case, uh, once again, the default uh, uh, for Windows is to hide the file extensions. So uh, you're not going to see that .scr, which is a screensaver, which is basically is just another executable. right? And this isn't even a screensaver. This is, uh, this is just an uh, executable file with a .scr file extension that's hidden on the default uh, settings in Windows. So you double click that and you're saying, where's my picture? How am I going to know if her hairstyle is better or not? I don't even know the woman. She just friended me an hour ago. Um, but with social media, because you've got to connect with people somehow, uh, generally social media tends to be a little more targeted than regular mass distribution methods. And um, so I've got an interesting story about this. Back in 2016, in August 2016, uh, when we were seeing a lot of ransomware, there was a lot of new co news coverage that was just annoying me. And sir, to your point earlier, uh, there were some hospitals that uh, got hit by, uh, I think it was Lockheed ransomware, and uh, which is, doesn't, is, isn't in the scene now. But that is generally spread through emails. And uh, I believe in one article they had mentioned something like a spray and pray attack. right? We'll just spray it out there. And, and I'm thinking, um, it's not an attack, right? It, you, got, you got hit with ransomware because uh, you were unaware enough to, to double click on a link. It was something that you did. It's not something that the criminal did any differently. It's something that you did different. Well, you did uh, uh, unknowingly, unaware. So I was saying, stop calling it a ransomware attack. Start calling it uh, an incident. Because in cybersecurity, in this field, the word incident has serious connotations. However, for a lot of people, they're thinking incident is just something that happens. So I got a lot of blowback from this. I got a lot of comments. And one of the comments was from somebody uh, that uh, uh, tagged themselves as Sarah the Enthusiast, who uh, wrote a very well 
reasoned um, uh, response that I thought, and said that uh, uh, that uh, and, and you know this is the internet, so I don't know if this person is actually named Sarah or not, but uh, he or she or he whoever it is, said that I think this type of malware is becoming so increasingly popular that even the carefulest, careful internet users can be tricked into downloading and opening a link. So uh, this person was the victim of a ransomware attack uh, two days uh, uh, before uh, she or he wrote this. And the hoax was so elaborate because uh, this person thought it was so much trouble uh, uh, that they went to to get uh, uh, her to download and click this file. So the long, uh, the short story is uh, Sarah the Enthusiast is a freelance writer, got contacted uh, about a writing assignment on freelancer.com. As part of the process, uh, connected with uh, a Skype account of a person that uh, she researched and thought, okay, this is a legitimate Skype account. And it was, but it was compromised. And it was being used by a criminal to rope in people, right? So Sarah the Enthusiast is thinking, oh, that's a lot of effort to get me to click on something. But I'm sure the person who had compromised the Skype account was trying to fool more than one person, right? So uh, as part of the process, Sarah the Enthusiast gets uh, a bunch of files, uh, PDF files, company guidelines, uh, the, the writing assignment guidelines, and something that's an exe file now sarah is no dummy uh, so sarah actually not realizing that the skype account was compromised contacts the skype account and says hey uh, i see this is a malware i'm sorry this is an executable uh this is kind of weird you're not trying to infect me are you ha ha and uh, of course, the criminal behind the Skype account said, uh, "Hey, this is uh, just part of a new uh, uh, new uh, format that we're using." And so, Sarah the enthusiast uh, double clicked on that uh, executable and got infected with ransomware. And I say this uh, uh, luckily got infected with ransomware because it could be far worse. Um, could be an information stealer. Could be a banking trojan, which, in my personal opinion, is worse because uh, they're able to steal all your passwords. If this is a straightforward ransomware, all they're doing is encrypting files on your machine. However, you do have to make the assumption that, uh, oh, they're probably, uh, if they infected my machine, they could very well have taken my passwords and log in account credentials. But uh, I like to share that story because uh, how many of us in this room think that, uh, you know, it'd just be too much trouble for somebody to target us in that fashion. You know, understanding that it's not really necessarily targeting, but going through a bunch of work to get us to click, double click in a Windows environment on an executable file. Uh, we probably don't think we're that important, but uh, we don't have to be. As long as you can scale your operations up, uh, any one of us can be a target of those criminals as long as they can scale their operations up. Um, so for distributing malware through the web, there are generally two types of methods. There are the unexpected web pages or pop-up windows, right? In that case, you actually have to do something to, to click or install something to uh, be infected. And then there are exploit kits, which are, uh, I gave a talk about exploit kits here at uh, B-Sides Iowa last year and had mentioned then they were on the wane and that uh, certainly has held true. So here's an example of a campaign that uh, uh, I had seen and I would uh, documented uh, on my blog uh, just some technical, uh, uh, some PCAPs and some malware samples and uh, Malware Bytes actually did a, uh, a good write-up on this relatively recently. I forget exactly what they called it. But uh, so in this case you got a compromised website and it has injected code, and it redirects you to, uh, to uh, this uh, fake flash player if you use an Internet Explorer. And of course, uh, you'll get plenty of warnings uh, uh, that this type of file is not something you want to double click. But uh, you know me, I'm a clicker. <laughs> 
you look at the code of uh, the file that you download, it's a highly obfuscated uh, JavaScript in this case, um, uh, run by Windows Scripting Host, and it's designed to check your computer. And I never was able to infect a host in a virtual environment uh, with this. Uh, I actually had to go through a physical environment because it, it uh, had some checks that were making sure that uh, uh, whoever cl uh, double-clicked that file was not... Um, uh, was not in a virtual environment. If you're running Chrome, you'll actually, from the hitting the same website and going through the same process, you won't have Flash because Chrome doesn't use Flash. Uh, so you get the same uh, same type of file, different file name. If you're using Firefox, it says, hey, you're using an older version of Firefox, even though I wasn't. And then it tells, uh, it gives you the same type of file. Now, when I first tried this out, all of those file names were the same exact file hash. However, uh, about a couple weeks later, when I checked it again, they were all different file hashes, just slightly different. And it is relatively easy for criminals uh, when they're doing stuff, when they're uh, compiling their malware, it's, it's easy to kind of uh, uh, put a little bit of, uh, uh, randomize the process just enough to add a, a couple spaces here, a couple of characters there, and uh, make your file hash different. Which is why earlier, when I was saying that uh, Palo Alto Networks on that query that I did in my, my company tool, that we saw 26,000, uh, more than 26,000 samples of ransomware, you know, that just means 26,000 different file hashes. A lot of those were pretty much the same thing, just uh, uh, every single time you downloaded it, it was a new file hash but it did the same exact thing. But exploit kits, uh, which once again, I did talk about here last year, uh, is a way to infect your computer behind the scenes. So basically you're just doing regular web browsing and you hit a, uh, in most cases nowadays, it's ad traffic, some banner ad has some injected code. It directs you to a, uh, to a uh, uh, exploit kit server behind the scene and it will send code, it will check to see if your browser-based components are vulnerable and infect your computer. Here is a, uh, my standard definition for exploit kits. The web servers that use uh, exploits to take vulner uh, advantage of vulnerabilities and browser-based applications, right? So it has to be a browser-based application. So if you're using uh, Java, if you're using Flash, if you're using Internet Explorer, is anybody still using Internet Explorer? Uh, I'm not saying it doesn't happen. Is anybody by choice using Internet Explorer? Uh, but uh, so interestingly enough, uh, Java and PDF, uh, those are big uh, uh, 2010 call. They want their exploits back. And uh, you just don't see this stuff uh, as much anymore. Flash Player is generally the only, uh, uh, Flash Player and Internet Explorer are the two that generally get exploited by uh, what remains in the exploit kit scene. And this is uh, literally what you're talking about as far as uh, uh, the infection chain. You've got a normal website. Uh, this could be CNN. This could be the New York Times. This could be any high profile website that buys ad traffic. And, uh, uh, I, I should say that uh, that gets uh, paid to air ad traffic. And then the banner ads, uh, which are not as, uh, as uh, thoroughly vetted as content on the site itself, actually has the uh, stuff. You'll have a gate. Uh, it's just another server that uh, kind of uh, keeps an eye on things and uh, you know, tries to make sure that you're not coming from the same IP address multiple times. Uh, you know, if you're a security researcher or something like that, it's a good way to uh, avoid it. But uh, exploit kits are really on the wane. So when I talked about it in April of uh, last year, we had seen markedly lower levels than the year before, and now it's probably about a tenth of that. Do you see those ever coming back at all, maybe? No, no. Um, I have never been able to use any of the current exploit kits to uh, infect a Windows 10 host, even, <laughs> even running Internet Explorer, which it can do on Windows 10. Uh, Microsoft Edge, and, and I know it can be done. I know it has been done. I just personally haven't been able to do it. And uh, uh, good God, Chrome, it, it's, uh, they really keep on top of things as far as uh, making sure that uh, um, 
exploit kit style infections where it's happening behind the scenes without your knowledge is not happening, right? Chrome will still happily let you, uh, you know, pop up those windows and say, hey, install this Chrome update because your Chrome is out of date. But um, exploit kits are, uh, because of that, you know, uh, many people use Chrome and uh, yeah, that sort of stuff is on the wane. Uh, so in addition to malware, what uh, some criminals uh, have done is instead of directing you to download and install a fake flash update or something, they'll say, uh, hey, you've got uh, it, your computer is infected. So uh, you, you get on one of these, uh, and it happens the same way. It's the same chain. Instead of going to an exploit kit, you're basically going to a page um, that has this uh, fake update. And you can't close your browser unless you go to your task manager and you kill that particular process. Uh, so it's easy enough to get out of. Every once in a while, my wife uh, will run across these. I'm like, you got to stop browsing to these, uh, 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 to these uh, gambling sites. <laughs> she doesn't gamble. I'm just kidding, honey. Uh, so that, uh, uh, I'm sorry, you know, this, uh, this is in Chrome, right? So Chrome doesn't stop this sort of stuff. Uh, in generally, I say Chrome doesn't stop this sort of stuff, but in my lab environment, I specifically, you know, change the settings in Chrome so it isn't blocking suspicious websites. So I, uh, uh, I revise that. Um, my environment doesn't block those. So if you go to Windows at the same thing, you get a slightly different looking thing uh, uh, with Internet Explorer, and you'll get a window that pops up. You'll try and close the window, and it will not close. It will just pop back up. And once again, you've got to go into Task Manager to, uh, to kill that process. If you're uh, going at the same website through uh, Firefox, uh, it will actually ask you for your username and password. Yeah. I'm astounded. It, why would I, I don't know. But uh, anyway, uh, uh, if anybody feels uh, curious enough, it's not going to hurt your computer. It's just going to uh, lock your browser up, and you'll have to kill that process. You could uh, probably go to this URL right now if you're curious. Once again, uh, uh, for, for the official record, I don't recommend it. Uh, prevention strategies. How do we stop this stuff from getting to us or for the people that we are responsible for protecting? Um, not really a prevention strategy. You're talking about regular backups. Um, so if you do get hit, and th this, this could be ransomware, but any type of decent disaster recovery plan, because you could get hit by a tornado here in Iowa, and uh, you can lose all your stuff. If you don't have your stuff, your, your critical data backed up, you'll never recover it, whether it's ransomware or whether it's some other sort of disaster. Patch your systems. Keep your systems patched and up to date as far as the software. Now, this is kind of common sense. And uh, uh, for the home user, we generally don't have to worry about that. But sometimes in an enterprise environment, you're still forced to use uh, Internet Explorer or uh, you know, use an out-of-date version of Java you know, because a particular mission critical application requires it. Uh, training and awareness. If you don't understand uh, the types of uh, threats you're facing, if you don't know what a phishing email is, uh, you'll probably click on it and be tricked. So uh, how many people have uh, been uh, 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 fished by your company to test and see if uh, you recognize a phishing email? It's, it's kind of common. Uh, there, there are good ways of doing it, and there are bad ways. Uh, the bad way is to make you feel like an idiot if you actually click the link, and that's not what it's all about. Uh, it's about trying to raise your awareness. Uh, browsing restrictions. If you like porn, if you like online gambling, if you like illegal file sharing, and you go to the internet for that stuff, you're probably going to run into some shady websites that uh, may direct you to malware. So uh, if you restrict yourself from browsing that stuff, you'll, you'll uh, be much in a much better situation. If uh, you're in a company uh, and you've got some sort of uh, web uh, filtering, you would hopefully be filtering out uh, at least those three categories of uh, web traffic. And then security solutions. 
So if you are, uh, if you're not looking at uh, what's happening in your network, you will never know if you have been compromised or in some cases when you were compromised. And that's pretty much it. We've covered the types of malware, distribution methods, tech support and scams, and prevention strategies. And uh, uh, I'm not going to uh, uh, waste time here with questions. Uh, however, I will be around if anybody does have any questions afterwards. I'll be more than happy to answer them. Thank you very much.